aspect of that. So today and in all of our days, we pray that you would continue to give us a fuller revelation of yourself that we might rest more securely in your grace for us in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So the name Martin Hanford may not mean much to you. You're running through, like, who is that? Uh, why should we know him, or should we know him? What, is he, uh, what has he done that's noteworthy, or maybe what has he done that's infamous? He's the creator of Where's Waldo? So I'll let you decide if that is noteworthy or infamous or somewhere in between. So most of us at some point in our lives have found ourselves staring at one of his creations. Uh, Looking at the dizzy number of people, we do our best to answer the question, where's Waldo? And in looking for Waldo, we have a few clues, right? There are at least three things by which we identify Waldo, and those three things are what? So he wears a red and white striped sweatshirt or sweater, and he wears uh, like a ski hat. It's red and white with a pom-pom on the top, and he has those big, round, dark spectacles. There he is. Where's Waldo? Uh, If we had more time, I would let you try and find Waldo in that picture, but it's hard to see, especially on the screen, so I'm going to save you the misery and all of us the time, and I'll just show you where he is. Uh, There's a, he's actually, whoops, I'll get it right there. He's right there. There's Waldo. So when it comes to Jesus, we often imagine that he too had identifying characteristics. Um, But do you remember what the prophet Isaiah said about Jesus about 800 years before the incarnation? Uh, This is what he wrote in the 53rd chapter, speaking prophetically of Jesus. Isaiah writes, uh, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. If I may add, there was nothing about Jesus' appearance that would have identified who he truly was. I know it seems like ages ago that we celebrated Christmas, but it was only like five weeks ago. And I want you to think about uh, the angelic message given to the shepherds, right? Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Why? Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Notice the angel did not say you will find a baby with a halo. Okay, but that's often, you know, artistic license here. He didn't say you would find a baby with a halo, and you certainly didn't say that the baby would be glowing with the glory of the Lord. That in terms of the identifying marks of the Savior, they're all too ordinary. What the Christ child is wearing, strips of cloth, where he is lying, laying, he's in a manger. Uh, Since most of us grew up knowing Jesus' true identity, it's hard for us to imagine that everybody didn't recognize him for who he is. And yet if we read all the gospel accounts, we see it's the exact opposite. Nobody really knew who he was. Even his own disciples, I mean, they're, they're living life close to him and And even they seem to be much in the dark. Uh, John writes in the opening chapter of his gospel these words about the mystery and the fact that it wasn't so self-evident who Jesus was. In that 10th verse, he says, He, referring to Jesus, was in the world, and even though the world was made through him, the world, that is, the people, did not recognize him. 
But even for the devout Jewish people who are asking the question, where is God's Messiah? Jesus didn't meet those expectations. We have a little challenge this morning, more so for me than you. We've got two Johns. We've got John the Baptist and John the Gospel writer. So I have to, do, I have to work really hard to keep those things separated. Maybe we should do JB and something, but we won't. So, so if, if you're familiar with John's gospel, John the Baptist plays a significant role in those early chapters. But both John the Baptist and the Apostle John, the writer of the gospel of John, have the same function that both of them testify to Jesus. And why do they testify to Jesus? So that others, including us, might believe. Uh, bear with me as we lay a little groundwork for this whole series on epiphanies. This is what is said of John the Baptist in John chapter 1. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. And the light is whom? Jesus, so he came to testify concerning Jesus. Why? So that through him, John and his testimony, all might believe in Jesus. And so we go from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 20, not chapter 21, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John says why he wrote his gospel. And we should commit these words to memory uh, he says that Jesus did many other miraculous things in the presence of his disciples, but they didn't make it into the book. He says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. True knowledge of God, someone wrote, is beyond human reason. Do you agree? A true knowledge of God is beyond human reason. It is a gift of divine disclosure it is, we might say, an epiphany. It's a divine revelation. In other words, none of us innately knows who God is. I think innately we know that God is, but innately we do not know who God is. And as we live life in and of ourselves, we can't figure it out that God has to make himself Known. So if you don't have it already, take out today's text, John chapter 1. You should be a little more awake than the early service. I, I threw them that really slow pitch so they could knock it out of the park. So as you read, I, what I want you to do is reread verse 29, and here's the slow pitch to you. What does John the Baptist reveal about Jesus' identity? Jesus is the Lamb of God. Excellent. The question is, how, how did John know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. All of us have been to seminars and get-togethers. You've got those name tags, and the top part says hello, and we get to put something beneath it. So, so did John know who Jesus was because Jesus was wearing a, hello, I'm the Lamb of God? No. In fact, twice, if you read on in there, twice in verse 31 and then 33, John says, I myself did not know him. And we're like, what? You leapt in your mom's womb when you heard Mary's voice. Well, he knew who he was. He's his cousin, uh, but he doesn't know his true identity. Uh, that such knowledge came to him by way of an... Revelation and Epiphany. That John says that, that God told him that uh, there would be key signs by which he would recognize who the chosen one was. Who that Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world, who would be the one that would come to baptize with the Holy Spirit, and what were the identifying signs? It wasn't a, a red and white striped sweater or a red and white striped hat and big round glasses. What was the identifying sign? That as John was going about baptizing people, and we can imagine he baptized a whole lot of people 
that he was told that when he baptized a certain individual, that the Spirit of God would not only come down upon him, but would remain, and that happened at Jesus' baptism. Interestingly enough, John doesn't include that account in his gospel. But if you think about it, John's gospel was most likely the, the last one written, right, seminarians? It was most likely the last one written. And so he makes the assumption that, hey, they already know those details. He doesn't have to include that particular thing. So the, so the epiphany, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that epiphany does two things. Actually, it does two times two. It does four, but we'll get to the other two in a moment. Uh, the two things that that epiphany does is that it reveals Jesus' identity and it states his purpose. It reveals his identity and states his purpose. So who is Jesus? He's the Lamb of God. But what in the world does that mean? I was reading something recently, and it was said, a uh, professor had asked an individual who, you know, the self-moniker was, I'm a mature, mature Christian. He says, well, what does the Lamb of God mean? And he says, it means that Jesus is kind and gentle. At least he didn't say cute and cuddly. <laughs> and as we think about it, Jesus is indeed kind and gentle, but he's making a very different point here. Although that terminology is laden with the Old Testament sacrificial system, right? And here's the thing. Uh, none of you would do it, of course. When you read books and you want to figure out how it ends, most of us don't start at the end. Some of you might. Uh, but most of us don't. Uh, maybe we would say John is a lousy writer because he begins by telling us how the story ends. Because in identifying John the Baptist and identifying Jesus, he says, here's the gift of God who's going to give his life for the world. That Jesus, through his own sacrifice, is going to take away the sins of the world and that as the gospel unfolds, what happens? Jesus gives his life away. But here's the detail we often miss is that when was Jesus crucified in relation to the Passover? On the very afternoon when the Passover lambs were slain. And as you think about Old Testament history, what, what did the uh, Passover celebration commemorate? Freedom, right? Freedom. Release from captivity. So it's the end of the plagues. Uh, Pharaoh, you know, he, he hardens his heart and then God hardens his heart, which, you know, we struggle a little bit with that. So it's the very end. Uh, we're coming to the culmination and God says, uh, take that lamb, a year old lamb without, without blemish and those that were under the blood, saved. And once the angel of death had passed through the land, God's people then begin their journey to freedom to discover what it means to be the people of God. But as we seek to make that connection to Jesus, is that uh, what does Jesus' death for us as the Lamb of God reveal? Are we spared or are we not spared? Under the blood. Safe. But more importantly, we're not, I shouldn't say more importantly, but uh, equally importantly is it, it, it lets us know that Jesus has affected a new and greater exodus. Uh, whether or not we recognize it in our daily life, at one time we were bound, and in Jesus we've been set free. At one time we weren't a people, but now we are the people of God. Uh, somebody said it in this way, that, that we have been brought out of an older and even darker slavery. And now we've been set free to live as God designed us to live. People ask me all kinds of questions over the years, and, and, and the thing I always want to know, what is the question behind the question, right? 
Uh, so, so occasionally someone will, will say to me something like this, Pastor, why do we have to learn these things? And the underlying sentiment is uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with real life, with my life. In other words, why can't we get to the good stuff? Why can't we get to the practical stuff? Like three steps to a, a more robust prayer life or, or four steps to live in a worry-free life or for very ambitious, ten steps to a better you and me. Why can't we just? Because all of those things are linked to Jesus' identity in this particular case, to the fact that he's the Lamb of God. Because having taken away the sins of the world, we can now boldly come before God's throne of grace in prayer. And if we are in Christ, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation. And then there's that part that we like so well, that nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to live a worry-free life, it's living life in light of Christ. And a better you and a better me, I need more help than you do, but a better you than a be and a better me, uh, we can't do it apart from Christ Jesus. It's the result of being who we already are in Christ. And that leads us to the second part of the epiphany. So we move from the who and the what of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We move from the who and the what of Jesus to the what and the who of us. What are we? Forgiven. And we hear that all the time. But I'm not sure it sinks in very well. Kind of if, if we could, in a hologram or something like that, we, we could see what we look like uh, on the inside. I, I think a lot of us are just kind of uh, weighed uh, heavily by the things of the past. Uh, that, that we bear far too great a burden uh, of shame and guilt, uh, the stuff that Jesus has uh, taken away. So, so what are we? We're, we're forgiven. Alleluia. And then it's who are we? That once we were alienated from God... That's what sin does. It separates, it alienates. But now that that's been dealt with decisively in Jesus, we've become what? Children of God. This is what John says about that in his uh, opening chapter in the prologue to the gospel. Uh, he talks about that Jesus came to his own, own didn't receive him, but to all who recognized him, who all received him, uh, to those who believed in his name, God gave the right to become children of God. And notice it has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with intelligence. It has nothing to do with human decision. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And here's the thing. As those who have been born of God, who have received the Spirit of God... We're now enabled to live life differently, more prayerful and less fretful and a better version of us because of the freedom we have in Christ. Again, why do we have to know so many things about Jesus? Why can't we just skip to the good stuff, to the practical stuff? Because our lives are inseparably linked to Jesus. And the better we know who he is and what he has done for us, the better we know who we are because of him and what it means to live a life for him. Uh, we're going to return to where we began to Martin Hufford and one of his creations. And as the creator of Where's Waldo, he places Waldo somewhere in the chaos of humanity. 
Now consider this, that our creator condescended to come into the chaos of humanity. But unlike Waldo, he doesn't come as a mere spectator. Jesus comes to rewrite the story of humanity. Let that sink in for a moment, that Jesus comes to rewrite the story of humanity. I believe that's why John's gospel begins with creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made. He begins with creation because Jesus condescends to enter the fray of humanity, to rewrite the story of humanity that he comes to be a curse, to break the curse. He comes to be bound that we might be free. He comes to die that we might experience life that is true life. He comes uh, to rewrite the story so that the ending for those who believe on him, for those who trust in him, is not a ghastly ending, but a most glorious ending. And there is the epiphany that the Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would forgive us for imagining that we know enough about you, that all we need are some pointers for living out a life of faith. And forgive us for imagining that in our foolish pride that somehow we connected the dots and that's why we know who you are. And why sometimes we shake our heads at others as if it is so transparent that if they would just open their eyes a little bit more fully, they would see things clearly. But we acknowledge as your word reveals that the only way in which we come to know you is that you have made yourself known in those epiphanies. And we have a role, just like John the Baptist did, that we can point others uh, to you, saying, Behold, this is who um, you are. You're the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But even in that, as important as that is, unless you open their eyes to see, their minds to understand, and their hearts to receive, you remain an enigma. So as you have been pleased to reveal yourself to us, we pray that you would reveal yourself to others, especially those we know so well. We ask that in your mercy, you would make yourself known that they too would see and believe. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lift your head, raise your eyes, look around.